I'm here with Murad Shaki. Yeah. Did I really? Murad. Oh, it's fine, I was so dude. focused on the surname. Dude, I, <laughs> as a person who fucks up other people's names, <laughs> I have all the, everybody, it's always somebody else getting like really upset on my behalf and I appreciate I'm it. I'm upset on, my, <laughs> yeah, on your yeah, behalf. Yeah. It's like, oh, I got it wrong. <laughs> can, <laughs> you know? can we note that I did nail it without knowing it the first time? Yes, and then yes, I did. yeah. Okay. That's not the usual. People don't usually get it right and then fuck it up. So, hey, at least it's memorable. So, uh, you're an, Amer an Egyptian American comedian from San Francisco. Your clips of Dirty Little Immigrant Boy <laughs> garnered over 30 million views across social media platforms. And you've accumulated all the followers, 300,000 followers across uh, Instagram, Facebook, and TikTok. Yeah. I feel so, like Facebook just doesn't count, though. Facebook counts. And you no, I know, a, because, like, Facebook presence they're, they've, and they're the ones that monetize the best, <laughs> and they're helping me pay my rent. But, like, if I get a, an audience boom in Facebook, I'm like, eh. And if I get it in Instagram, I'm like, yes, I don't. I, but and Facebook, TikTok, I'm like, fuck these Zoomers. They don't, they don't know good content when it. <laughs> well, the Facebook people can afford tickets to the show. So yeah, actually... and it, it's it's funny because like, I think I feel like Facebook is like in a weird way the least superficial mm. uh, social media because it's not like just Instagram where people are trying to make their life look cool or TikTok where people are just participating and. Basically, I think it's just the new TV, except you can <laughs> upload your own shit. Um, but Facebook is like, you plan like activities out on Facebook. <laughs> so like people who engage on that are like, they are will buy tickets to your show and stuff. So yeah, yeah, go Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> that was a real lesson. Yeah, Thank woo! you, Mark Zuckerberg. <laughs> yeah, 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 love it. Uh, that's very funny. So let's take it all the way to start. When did you start comedy? Uh, I had a false start, like, uh, I did it a couple times in high school and college, but it's like, we do an open mic every six months, it doesn't really count, right? Um, and then, I, I transferred schools in, like, my second or third year, second year, and, uh, I, like, I did pretty well for myself socially at my first school, and I, when I transferred, I was like, I'll just make a bunch of friends here, I'll go do a bunch of stand-up in San Francisco, but I went to USF, which is, I didn't get the memo, it's a commuter school. So I'd be like, after class, I'd be like, hey, what's the move, guys? And they're like, I'm going home to San Mateo, 45 minutes away. So like, I kind of like, I don't know, you move to a new city, it's hard yeah. to make friends in a new yeah. city. So like, kind of like, I fell into like this weed coma for like two or three years. And then uh, I got, I graduated, I, I got one of the few stable jobs you can get with a journalism degree, <laughs> which is PR. <laughs> And then uh, Pokemon fired me and I started doing stand-up. Yeah, yeah, My first week on the job uh, doing PR at this like video game PR agency, like our big client was uh, Pokemon. Our first week, I think the NDA expired. I don't give a shit. Uh, <laughs> our first week, uh, I didn't realize the Pokemon TV show was still going at the time. And uh, there was some controversy, controversy because to blend in, with a monkey Pokemon, Ash put on blackface. And that was my first week on the job. <laughs> and like, I, cause I'd worked in like film PR and uh, tech PR. Um, and I hated my job. Cause it's like, 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 all right. Like, let's say you're a barista, you're on your feet all day. It's a tough job, but you're making coffee for someone. The coffee is giving them some fuel. Mm -hmm. It's part of their routine. It maybe enables them to go do their job. You work for like eight hours at a PR job. You're like, I made no difference in the world. <laughs> I wrote a press release that a bot is gonna read and nobody fucking else. And I was just getting really depressed by it. I was like, oh, maybe if I switch to an industry that's fun, mm -hmm. it'll be cool. And it wasn't because if you work in a fun industry, they know you're working on passion, so they exploit you, right? Mm -hmm. So like, I was still pretty miserable at this place, and I was just getting ripped stoned before like, before I showed up. I was just, I the amount, dude, I would take a gram of weed to the face at 7 a.m. <laughs> Just to just to get the strength to commute to this place. And this was the PR job? Sometimes. Yeah, and I would show up blitzed, but nobody, I did fine or whatever. And the, the thing about weed is it, it makes you kind of tolerate mediocrity, right? Uh, <laughs> and I hit a point where it's like, all right, I got to get it together. I got to be professional. And I stopped doing that. 
and then I realized how shitty they treated us. And I just didn't notice before because I was just like, Pikachu, you know? Like, <laughs> <laughs> and so like I was getting good performance reviews, um, but I was becoming increasingly like, I was like, hey, when I joined this company, I told you I was good at this, this, and this, and that's why you hired me. And you've just made me this data entry monkey. Mm. Obviously, I'm using politer terms in this, but it's like, like this is not the job I thought I was getting. And you also said, you do this by this point, you do this by this point, and it's not happening. So they decided to fire me two weeks before Christmas so they wouldn't have to give me the bonus. Um, and I, uh, I had this really thick porcelain Pikachu mug from one of the conventions <laughs> and I step outside of the office and I throw it on the ground in anger and it just bounced. <laughs> and I've never felt so impotent. <laughs> And emasculated in my fucking life. Pikachu's dude. looking open. Yeah, like, it's like I... <laughs> uh, so at that point, it was like, all right, bro. Like, at that point, I already felt like I'd given up on my dreams. Um, and I was like, okay, dude, you're you're 23. You're fired. If you were ever gonna like tell some dick jokes, now's the time. And I just um, I bummed in my sister's garage for six months, and I was just doing. Dude, I was doing like five open mics a day. Wow. And like the only days you couldn't do that was like Friday and Saturday because that's when the venues wanted proper shows. Mm -hmm. um, Thursday too was a little hard. Um, and then, you know, it's just like, I imagine it's like here, like, you know, at an open mic, you have a lot of insane people, but you also have like a lot of legit comics who are just trying to work out a new bit mm -hmm. that, you know, they wrote. Um, so eventually, like, local comics and producers noticed me. I started running my own shows. And then um, <laughs> then COVID hit. Uh, and uh, as soon as we got outdoor dining, um, I started running as many shows as I could because um, we were the only safe, we, we were the only legal live entertainment in town mm -hmm. because it's just a person with a microphone. Like, you couldn't have a live band because mm -hmm. that was too many people close to each other. So I started this thing called Dope Show and there's like Dope Show Bay Area and Dope Show LA. And we just kind of like filled the space. And I was running like six or sh seven shows a week. I started meeting a lot of people in LA. Um, I started getting booked down there and I got uh, the taping Dirty Little Immigrant Boy mm -hmm. with a Don't Tell Comedy. Do you know Don't Tell? Yeah, of yeah, course. Yeah, it's, yeah. It's, yeah, I, 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 people who don't know it, I'm like, it's just Gen Z dry bar. That's all it is. <laughs> and it's beautiful. Uh, the standard's so high. It's for the... beautiful. Yeah, Cole Garrett, <laughs> the very funny, very sweet Cole Garrett uh, booked me. And um, it was funny too, because my taping was, um, it was like six people, killers, all of them. Half of them bombed. The crowd was terrible. Mm. Half the tapings were scrapped. Only me, Jessica, Michelle Singleton, and oh no, Matt Lockwood. Yes, I did. <laughs> uh, Matt Lockwood. Uh, our three sets were the only ones that uh, made it out. Mm. And the thing is, is I, I was the only person on that lineup that had performed at that particular venue before. Mm. And I knew how dead the crowd could be. Mm. So I was like, I'm going to go up there. I'm just doing this for the camera. Fuck <laughs> Fuck these people. Uh, and it worked out. And like, um, I had my two jokes that got me my audience. One of them was off the taping. It was just like my own clip. Um, it was like a clip about like my racial ambiguity and then a clip about eating ass. And that's how I got, it. that's how I got my following. Fuck Pokemon. Mommy. Yeah. I have a real weird mix of people at my show. Cause a lot of it is just, you know, average, like just people just like me, but also like I'll have this mix of like perverts and like, <laughs> and then like older Muslim women in, in hijabs. And I'm like, boy, most of my set is about sucking and fucking. So I really hope. You're just bringing communities yeah. together. That's all I'm yeah, hearing. You're so yeah. racist. Yeah, I'm kind of the voice of a generation, <laughs> honestly. <laughs> so you basically just went full time comedy from the job? Yeah, I did. I was like, I was. Uh, it's weird. I, I don't say this to discredit myself. I used to say this to discredit myself, but it's like, I was lucky that I had like family I could freeload with. Mm -hmm. And like, I'm one of those rare comedians where uh, their family's like supportive and believes <laughs> in their dreams and stuff. Um, and then the thing is, is like, you know, when you're new and you run shows, it's to give yourself stage time. Mm -hmm. But I, I literally just fell ass backwards into making a living off of it. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, and now I'm here. <laughs> well, I, so explain, you ran a show every night, basically, didn't you? Uh, it was uh, it was Tuesday through Sunday, but it'd be six or seven because one or two of those nights would be a doubleheader, mm. you know? 
Um, so yeah, I still like, even if I have a wonderfully successful career, I still might never work as hard as I did at, <laughs> at peak dope show because like now dope show, like it's seasonal in the Bay area. It's like October through March mm. and L LA is just like this twice a month show or whatever. Uh, cause I had to down, I had to downsize it. Cause like it was getting like, I have a good reputation in the sense of like, like I, I won't rip you off. I'm like a friendly person. I like you know giving stage time to like a new promising person. I do not have a good reputation for being organized. <laughs> uh, so like, there was a certain point where it's like not only do I need to like delegate more work, I also just have to do less. And like, I had that like when I started, I had that like famine mentality of like you just wasted three years of your life you have to you cannot say no to a single set mm -hmm. and then covid hit and it's like you lost another <laughs> fucking you cannot turn down any and then they hit a point where i was like really just this year like like i realized i'd been burnt out for probably a like a straight up like almost two years mm -hmm. i'd just been running on fumes and i just hit a breaking point just in like april mm -hmm. and for the first time i took a break i just didn't do stand up for a month and holy, and that's also when I booked this, cause I was like, this is the first time standup has not been fun for mm -hmm. me. Even when I'm doing well, I just am not enjoying it. You mean like, this trip or this podcast, sorry? No, this trip, <laughs> <laughs> this trip, cause I was like, I need a fucking change of scenery or mm -hmm. whatever. Fortunately, after like my break, I like got back into it. I had some tour dates that I just had to do. And um, I was getting back into the vibe of it. But like this trip has been, was sorely needed, like, just it, be excited to do it in front of a new audience and a new area and stuff like that. It's been a lot of fun. Well, good job you for recognizing <laughs> that you needed a break. Yeah, it's tough. It's tough. Just fucking. It's weird. I always. Growing up, like I always just thought I was this like lazy ADHD piece of shit. But um, when I'm into something like comedy is the first time anybody's ever called me a hard worker in my life. And I'm like, wow, I tricked them. I'm, <laughs> I've somehow fooled them into thinking I'm a hard worker. <laughs> and what about running the night? So in my situation, I've recently just sort of stopped working as a software engineer. Um, their choice, but that's fine. I was an awful employee. <laughs> I was a terrible employee and I recognize that unless they ask in which case I was a great employee. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but my plan is to, to run multiple nights. So mm -hmm. do you think that's a good plan? Absolutely. Um, like, the old we were talking earlier the old i don't know if i'm using this fancy word right the old <laughs> paradigm uh was like I don't, even, I don't think i'm using it right. <laughs> was fine. like you hit a certain point in your career in the states you either have to move to la or new york because that's what, where all the industry is like if you want to act or write you're going to la if you go to new york it's more for stand-up also some writing but mostly for um stand-up but um uh by running all those shows in the bay like I was just importing comics from LA all mm. the time. And I kind of met everybody I needed to meet for my goals. You know what I mean? Like, like, so if you run a bunch of shows, like that's how you, you get the opportunities to come to you. Mm. So like, absolutely. Um, just don't do as I did <laughs> and maybe just, you know, be kind to yourself, <laughs> delegate, maybe give up money once in a while, just so you're not like, cause I was like, I'm, I'm showing up to these venues, I'm clearing out the tables, I'm setting up the folding chairs, I'm checking people That's in, I'm hosting. <laughs> yeah, and you got it, and honestly, dude, I was cut. I was like, I was in good shape. It was like, because it was like low key CrossFit, just like, yeah. And it's like, once I started running just one or two shows a week, I still started gaining weight. And I was like, oh fuck, that was my exercise. I gotta start moving again. And were you always performing at the shows you're running as well? I don't think I ever skipped one. Mm. I really, I really, I'm thinking, and I don't think I've, I've ever, the only time I've ever skipped them is when I hired somebody else to run it. And I just like, either I had another booking or I just was mm. sick, didn't leave the house, something like that. Mm. Um, but if I was physically there, I was going up. Mm. Like I even would show up and be like, I'm, ju I'm just gonna watch this one. I'm just gonna watch. <laughs> and then the host would be like, Give and then I'd go up to the host and I'd be like, is there, do you think there's time for a guest scene? He's like, it's fucking your show. 
<laughs> and I'm like, I know, but like in your artistic, you know, opinion, do you think this audience is too fatigued? They're like, just go. And I'm like, okay, all right, I'll do it. We've already scheduled you in. You do this every week. <laughs> and then, yeah, no, and it's like, I go, I'm, I'm just gonna do five. I'm just gonna do five. And then 12 minutes later, I'm off stage. I'm like, oh, I'm a bitch. <laughs> well, the set you published is so punchy. It's oh, thank so, you. Every line, it's so good. Thank you. And I didn't, I really didn't, I didn't know the crowd was a struggle because I was like, he's fucking murdered. <laughs> oh, thank you. If you read the YouTube comments, I did there's the a lot of people who are like, why is this crowd so dead? Um, also, the, the the first comment on it, because like people are comedy nerds now. Like like the way someone who enjoys like like soccer or American football, but who has never played it, can mm. still have an eye for like tactics and stuff mm. because they're so deep in. I feel like that's how comedy fans are now. Mm. Uh, and the first YouTube comment was a perfect breakdown of all of my shortcomings. <laughs> And like it was on point. It's like this Mom. guy, this guy is going too fast. When he gets a laugh, he moves on to the next joke and he's stepping on his own laughs. And this is some dude who's clearly never done comedy. <laughs> and I'm like, oh shit, dude, you're right. I should slow down. <laughs> that was very good. Yeah. But it's like when you have a taping like that, I'm like, I'm getting all the jokes. Because it's like, I know these are chopped up and put on TikTok. I'm, <laughs> I'm getting as many in as I can. Um, You're preaching to the choir. Yeah, 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 <laughs> I mean, yeah. that's, um, but interestingly, you, I was, I'll ask you about you right and after. But interestingly, on your profile, it says you don't have an agent. Is yeah, that, is that by choice or what's the? Um, I'd been approached by like one major management thing, and like it seemed like a very good offer, and like God knows I could still use the help in some ways, but uh, the margins on comedy are so brutal that I was like, I think I'd want to see if I can keep my 10% mm. and see how far I can go because I've never had writing or acting aspirations. I just want to, I hate group projects. <laughs> Fuck it, the idea, I've never found anything less appealing than like, because like anytime I've done a writer's room with comics just to like punch up jokes, I leave it going like, boy, I sure made everybody else's jokes better. <laughs> you know, and it just sounds arrogant, but it's like, it's just like, I just know that if I was in a writer's room for a TV show and I came up with a funny line, I'd be like, fuck, I wish that was in my act and mm. not this show or whatever. So like the the group that approached me, like, part of me is like, damn, I should have taken him. But, uh, but it's, you know. Well, I really respect independence. I yeah. think it's going to be But also, so I've, I've also not been approached by it. <laughs> I'm like the only dude on Don't Tell that has, uh, that doesn't, well, I don't live and everybody thinks over there that I live in LA and I'm just mm. like a recluse, but I live in Berkeley. Uh. <laughs> uh, you just haven't moved out of the Bay because it's just like, doesn't seem like I, I need to. And it's mm. weird because it simultaneously feels like the smart decision for my career and the lazy one. Mm. You know what I mean? So there's some days I'm just like, ah, I'm refusing to grow up or whatever. And then some days I'm like, I beat the system. You know? So, um, But with the following, do you really feel like an agent's going to add anything? The only, the, well, agents have like, you know, it's weird. Like they just have like connections with venues and, and club circuits and stuff like that. And if I like, like I can get myself booked at venues, but like getting your f foot in the door is so hard, not because they are dismissive of you. It's just that like, you know, I think when they get an email from like WME or Brillstein or something like that, it just goes to the top of their inbox. Mm. But if it's just Murad Chucky, it's just like, you know, it falls in mm. wherever. Cause it's like, I would just, you know, like I do know that if I got management, the calendar would fill up a lot easier. And you know, as like a comic now, it's like you're your own podcast producer. You're like an editor, mm. you're a comedian, you're a show producer you are editing your clips, you're doing subtitles, mm. and like to also be your own tour booker on top of that. That's a... You could use, yeah, I, I'm hoping to get to a point where I'm making enough money where I can just kind of hire an assistant mm. and they would do basically what the agent is doing, but you know. Um, no, that is a good point. Yeah. They had the legitimacy for bookings, I suppose. Mm -hmm. But I think it's very cool what you're doing. Going, Thank you, man. You built up the follow. It's not like you got no results. <laughs> it's yeah. Like, fuck the agent. <laughs> That's what makes booking venues so aggravating because I'm looking at their calendar and I'm like, I have a, this would be good for both of us. Your headliner this weekend has no audience. Just, I'm just trying to get a Tuesday, bro. Like, get back to me. Like, do, you, do you think it's going to change? Oh, yeah. And it already is. Um, but like I've only been like properly touring since I'm almost embarrassed to admit it. February, like like this time last year. Well, like 
I'll say like 13 or 14 months ago, because my mm -hmm. taping came out, I think almost exactly a year ago. I had like 900 followers across mm -hmm. all my platforms. Wow. And uh, when the taping came out, I got like 10K. I was like, oh my God, that's crazy. And I started posting clips and I was like building, like by like September, I got to like 30K and I was like, this is great. And then I ran out of like material to post that I felt was ready to post. And a comedian was just like, hey man, just repost your your most viewed joke like off of feed. Like that's the thing on Instagram. Like you can make your reel not show up on your feed and it just goes out into the real ether. Oh, you have basically. to explain this. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, it's very useful. Um, and it blew up again, except the difference was, like the first time my clip blew up, if they went to my profile, there was one other clip they could watch. Mm. So they couldn't exactly binge or whatever. They just see like, a cumulative like three minutes of material and they dip. But this time I got that big exposure again, except people could binge watch me for like 20 or 30 minutes. So in just November, I went from like 20K to to basically the audience I have now, which oh is like God. almost three, like it's like, I don't know, saying the number feels, it's a big, it's a much bigger audience. I could say it's a, it's a 300K at least, uh, uh, more. Yeah, 350. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> um, and that's when I was like, oh fuck, it's, it is time to tour. And I started co-headlining because I just wasn't sure if I had more than 30 or 40. But uh, I got booked by this club in Calgary, which is like the Texas of Canada. Mm. Uh, and they wanted me, like a normal weekend is like a Friday, Saturday, maybe you add a Thursday or a Sunday to it. They wanted me to do six nights solo. And they were, and I was like, hey, I don't, think I have an audience in Calgary like I don't think I like I don't know if I'd have an easy time selling one night mm -hmm. and they were like oh no we pay you a flat rate we don't care like if you we just they just needed a warm body doing stand-up mm -hmm. so I spent uh you know freshly dumped <laughs> to <laughs> spent a week in uh Calgary just getting blowed uh, nosebleeds from how dry it is out there <laughs> uh and I just kind of found out like, oh shit, I no, I can do an hour. I can do a, a good hour. And I, and like, I like, I don't know, the, the, this headlining show I have at the Bill Murray um, <laughs> on the 22nd um, is probably only my eighth or ninth like proper headlining mm. date. So it's but all been very new. It's but, all been very dense. for you means doing the show like, like doing, doing a proper show? hour, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because yeah, okay. yeah. headline here, not just, just like, like doing fifteen minutes yeah. at the end. That yeah. I'd I'd done a bunch of, yeah. but like in terms of like a long form set, yeah. Well, uh, congratulations! Thank I think you. It's, I think it's earned because it's, it's a lot of work to do the like the like. I think people get confused because the results are what uh, what's that called when it, exponential, mm -hmm. but like it's a lot of work to get to that point. Yeah, yeah. I wish I had something to contribute <laughs> to that, but I don't. It's <laughs> been pretty fucking exhausting. Um, but I've been also having a a. a Last. The crowds oh, cool. here are so fun, um, really polite. Um, I feel like I get heckled way more in the States, like way, way more. Uh, I don't know if the UK manners stereotype is true, mm. but I also feel like people here are just generally more polite. Like, uh, Also, like I live in San Francisco, so it's a bunch of techies, so it's very autistic. <laughs> And, and, You'll find that in some some. Oh yeah, because it's like I, uh, I I used to run a show with uh, my dear hilarious friend Victor Trevino. He still runs this show from time to time. It's it was at uh, Noise Bridge, which is an anarchist tech co-op, mm. very San Francisco thing. I don't even know any of the. Basically, words. it means it's where people go to invent shit or to do like like. It really <laughs> illegal cyber crime. Like, I'm not even joking. Like, I like like I was like standing in there, and I was like, I wonder how many millions of dollars have been stolen in this room. <laughs> uh, but it was this amazing room because like they had this little performance area, and all these fucking nerds just like like would just contribute to the like we had this backdrop. It was a bunch of milk crates filled with these Coca Cola mm -hmm. bottles that had these LED lights in them that would flash at like mm -hmm. really cool intervals. We had a robot bartender. Wow. But I, I established all this because we'd have this techie audience and you'd do a joke and you wouldn't bomb, but you wouldn't get a big laugh. You just see this sea of smiling faces because of how <laughs> spectrum either were. They'd just be like. <laughs> and my, my friend, Mark Smalls, he also has like a taping on Don't Tell He's Hilarious. I remember he was headlining our show and he was getting that reaction and he just went, 
man, I'm killing and y'all aren't letting me. <laughs> and I was like, that's exactly it. That's exactly it. But, but the show is actually great now. And like uh, Victor and my friend Ryan Sadakran have added this thing since like the AI craze mm -hmm. where like you do a set and then like the, the AI is listening to the set and it does its own version of it. Wow. It's very, it's, it's very, very cool. That's innovative. I yeah, like that. Yeah, that's yeah. cool. Yeah. That's very cool. Well, back to the punching material. Mm -hmm. uh, what is the process? How do you go from idea to? Uh, usually it's conversational, uh, which is like, it's weird. I heard, I don't know on like what podcast, but I heard Jim Gaffigan say something that Dave Chappelle told him. <laughs> so this is fourth hand information. <laughs> but uh, apparently Chappelle told him that he's like, figure out the circumstances in which you are most creative and then just try to keep recreating the circumstances. Uh, Cause like I have a lot of trouble, like a lot of people just staring at a blank page and hoping something comes mm -hmm. out. And I just find that I like having a conversation like this, I some some funny topic comes up, I write a line down in my phone, maybe I think of a second line and then I go on stage and I know I have three lines of it figured out or mm -hmm. whatever and I just sandwich it in between some like, um, more reliable material. But um, part of why like I think you say it's punchy is like SF is like a very disciplined scene, like a very, uh, like the way you, like the biggest club in, in California that isn't like, you know, one of the big three in Los Angeles is the San Francisco punchline. And they've had this thing called the Sunday showcase for like decades, like Robin Williams and Richard Pryor used to do it. Mm -hmm. Um, also San Francisco has a long, like, most current massive headliners lived in San Francisco for a couple years in the early 90s. It's mm. weird. They all just kind of showed up there at the same time. Mm. Um, but the way it works is if you're new, you show up on a Sunday. Uh, they let you in for free. You have to introduce yourself to the booker. And then you have to show up basically every Sunday for eight to ten months. Uh, because It used to be shorter, but basically they just want to make sure that you're not trying this out for fun or mm. just to see what it's like or something. They want to make sure that if they're going to put you up, that you're someone who's been taking it seriously. Mm. So I showed up, I like did my time just waiting and waiting and oh, waiting. Oh, you're just watching in this? Oh, for like eight months, every, every single Sunday. Mm. And the way they book it, uh, which is so different from here, <laughs> uh, it's like by the time I was like in the ninth month or whatever, and I knew I was due, like, our booker, Ron Vi, uh, he now does it like remotely and now uh, like Steve Osborne and Ben Feldman run it. Um, and they're very, very, promise I'm not kissing your asses. You guys are awesome. <laughs> to work with. Um, Ron would walk around like, uh, oh my God, who's the, oh, he'd, you know, Joaquin Phoenix and Gladiator. Mm. <laughs> yeah. He would just like walk up and he was the, the master of avoiding eye contact because he would walk out and there'd be a hundred comics just like, like, Please love me. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Like, like there, there were people that complained about the system, and I'm like, bro, if I was the, the catalyst for a thousand insane people's hopes and dreams, I don't know how friendly I'd be. Though. <laughs> like, I really don't know. What he would do is he'd walk around seeing who's here, and he would always turn his head really quick because if you couldn't catch his eyes, you know what I mean? Because if he was turning it slowly, he'd be like, "Please notice me" or whatever. So he's turning it quick, and I remember I was just due. And he, like, there was a comic on, they're doing six minutes, they're three minutes into their set, mm. and Ron comes up to me and he's like, five minutes? And I was like, okay. And he's like, you're up next. And like, you get two or three minutes notice, mm. you're performing for this crowd of like, maybe 150 people, but also, no, I'm getting these numbers wrong. Maybe like, let's say 120 people, but what the audience doesn't know is that everybody in the risers on the side of the stage are all comedians waiting their turn. So you're performing for like 120 people and 80 of your colleagues <laughs> on three minutes notice. Mm. Um, so you have to be super tight. Mm. Uh, like they wanna see like a tight, reliable set and they you have to, if they like you, they put you up again in like three or four months. If they like you again, they put you up in like two or three months. Mm. And then you start getting guest sets on a random Tuesday show, a random mm. Wednesday show. Then you get an audition. And if you pass the audition, you're like a regular. But because it's so competitive, people are like tight. Mm. And that's why like our scene does disproportionately well in like LA and New York. Like, like don't tell huge number of mm. Bay Area alumni where it's like like Andrew Rolfo, Dawood Namiar. Mark Smalls, Irene Tu, 
uh, Jeff Dean, like just like all the homies yeah. <laughs> are, are on Don't Tell. Mm. Uh, and I, I really think it's just because of how like cutthroat the Sunday showcase could mm. be. And then once you get comfortable, you realize it's just like a lovely place to see all your friends every Sunday mm -hmm. and it becomes a lot more relaxed. Sure. Like I used to be stressed out every time I walked <laughs> in there and I'm just like, what's up guys? Like, <laughs> and, and once you get past, it's great because like you get up like pretty regularly. It's a four camera shoot in a packed club. One of the best in the country. It's Dave Chappelle's literal number one favorite club. Uh -huh. He does pop-up shows there all the time. Like I really, if you, if you're ever in the Bay area, I know you have the money. Uh, ju uh, just, just go. You should go so catch the ten months. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I'm not talking about the comics. Yeah, you guys, please quit. <laughs> like, like, <laughs> there's too many. There is too many. Uh, that's very good. Uh, what about weird gigs? Did you do any weird gigs in the early? My days? first paid gig, paid quote unquote, uh, for the listeners. There's a heavy quote <laughs> quote unquote happening. Um, I got a. Gr do you know what Keith is? No. Yeah, Keith. Uh, when you grind weed. Uh, okay, I thought you said a person's name. No, no, no. Oh, no. Keep, uh, uh, first off, how the fuck is weed not legal here? <laughs> I just assumed when I landed here that I could swing by a dispensary and I was like, oh, no. <laughs> Gonna have some real sauce to deal with. It's like, fuck, oh, I have to drink? God damn it. Because when you're a pothead, alcohol is just kind of icky. <laughs> um, but um, in a weed grinder, a lot of them will have like this mesh filter mm. and like the tiny microscopic weed crumbs are like the ultra potent mm. they're called trichomes oh, wow. uh and they collect into like a little it's just like the crack rock of weed basically <laughs> and that was my first paid gig is i got a, a gram of weed <laughs> uh, at a place called mutiny radio um and uh oh dude my uh i still think the biggest bomb to this day for me um I did like a like an all black birthday party in South <laughs> San Francisco, and like the clip that got me like that got me to blow up is about my racial ambiguity, and it's about like this weird gray area with North Africans where like nobody's sure if they're black or not, and everybody just wants to, because the West is so like binary with race mm. that they don't understand that Egypt is like Brazil where it's got like the full rainbow of mm. people and genetics and that I'm just Egyptian, you know what I mean? <laughs> Which is weird because I feel like I'm saying I'm not black, I'm OJ, you know? <laughs> <laughs> um, but the way that bit started, because I was new and a hack, uh, I would just ask the audience cold if I was white or not. And I was used to a bunch of white San Francisco hipsters giggling nervously mm. and I could roll with that. But I did that at this all black birthday party and they all started giving me their opinion at the same time. <laughs> and I was hit with this wall of noise and derision <laughs> and condescension. And because it was all at once, I couldn't make out individual voices. <laughs> So I couldn't even respond to people. Like I couldn't even try and roll with the punches. <laughs> the one voice I heard in the back was, it depends. <laughs> uh, but I heard like someone to the right of me go, you nappy headed idiot or whatever. Um, and the worst part is I've bombed where nobody's laughing and that doesn't feel good. This was worse because what happened was they just started talking to each other. <laughs> And like eventually it was just like a bunch of friends just chatting while I'm trying to do my act. And it's like, at least when I'm bombing in silence, I have your attention. Like at least I have your focus. <laughs> and that's the reason that bomb was the worst because it was like I was invisible. <laughs> and I remember I stepped out just like, I would smoke a joint the way like Ray Liotta would smoke a cigarette. Like, like you know what I mean? Just like, whew, or whatever. And there were like a couple comics that I like admired on the show and I wanted them to see me do well. Obviously they didn't. And I step outside and one of them's out there. I'm about to talk to him, but I get cut off by this like very nice old black man, like very like fatherly kind attitude and comes up to me and he's like, hey man, you just gotta write new jokes. <laughs> And, and my friend Kelly Evans, who, who I didn't know very well at the time, and I wanted to do well in front of him, he's just like he's just like smoking his cigarette like across the street, and he just starts pointing and laughing at me, <laughs> like while I'm nodding to this guy politely, and Kelly's just like, ah. <laughs> uh, why did I, oh, we were just talking about weird gigs. Yeah, okay. I was like, why am I talking? About this? Um, yeah, I'm trying to think if I've had any like. I did point. a lot of corporate. 
you know what paid the rent for me during COVID was corporate Zoom gigs mm. because people were just desperate for some <laughs> sense of, but they, they're still the p- best paying gigs I've ever, dude, I would make like, I would pay my rent with a seven minute clean set on Zoom where I didn't even have to leave my house. Do you have to write about the company or anything? No, you just had to have a clean set. And um, I remember we had two in a day once and it was, uh, one was for the credit card company, Capital One, and it was for their Indian engineering team. And then the other one was for Snapchat. Mm. I wasn't nervous about the Snapchat one. I was nervous about Capital One, wondering if the humor <laughs> would translate to the, like, the overseas staff. The Capital One show was first awesome. <laughs> Corporate gigs usually are terrible because even if they like your material, HR is right there and they don't know what they can laugh at and what they can't. But that I feel like that's like a Western thing. Whereas like these people were just like, let's have a good time, you know? <laughs> and it was, everybody crushed, it was so fun. And then Snapchat, I'm not even worried about Snapchat. It like, like it, oh, the Zoom opens, it's like a rainbow of young people of like, like every, it's like algorithmic, like every <laughs> race, <don't> <laughs> my age group. I'm like, the, this is my demo, silence. <laughs> Just silence from front to back. My friend Logan Gunselman, who's a, a door guy at the store, uh, one of her, like, she still opens with a joke about that gig, which I booked her on, uh, <laughs> where uh, some guy was on his phone and she, for her, her whole set. And she's like, hey, what are you doing on your phone? And he turned it around and it was LinkedIn jobs. And he was <laughs> looking for another job during her set. <laughs> Yeah, that was brutal. <laughs> that was brutal. I remember. Uh, I think I booked my. He's he used to, he's a, a paid regular at the store. Uh, Stephen Fury, uh, very funny. I still I run my LA show with him. Um, the only time I've ever seen the fear of God in his eyes. Mm-hmm. He's like one of the most like swaggy, confident, charismatic, really skilled comic. Great reputation, uh, but he's also like a technophobe. Sorry, Steve, but you are, <laughs> uh, and like. First off, like I, we'd have our zooms where you have the gallery view. You can see like, you know, the the forty people who are actually there. He had his where it's like in that little bar at the top. So to him, it only looked like three or four people were there, <laughs> and he was just getting silence. And I remember he did one of his like most reliable jokes, which one of the best things as a comic is seeing one of your very skilled friends bomb because you don't feel bad because you know they're doing well otherwise. Mm. And you just, it's fun because you get to see them deal with the challenge. Mm. But to see him do like, ah, this this one will get him. (laughs) And then it doesn't. I just remember seeing his eyes go like, (laughs) Like, I just remember just like, just this like, oh, I'm mortal. Oh no. (laughs) What about you? Oh, I guess maybe you've probably talked about. Your, oh yeah, yeah. yeah oh, every yeah. gig did, but <laughs> that's that's funny. The Snapchat, they just, they just delete Snapchat on his phone after. Like, you guys, I'm gonna Instagram. <laughs> so this is a stupid app anyway, dude. <laughs> uh, what about what's the worst device you hear given to comics? You know, I heard. I, it's weird. I, I, I here's actually a bit of good advice I heard mm. that's about bad advice. Mm which is like when a comic is giving you feedback, nine times out of 10, they're just trying to tell you how to be more like them. Mm. And that's something I I bump into a lot is like somebody's like, you gotta do it this way. And it's like, no, you got to. Mm -hmm. Um, And like, I'm trying to think of like specifically bad advice I've gotten. That's very good. That thing you just said. Yeah, just no. Because like, whenever I tell, whenever I, whenever I'm like, oh look, I'm just like, oh, I'm just trying to make it And like sometimes oh, oh, counter kind of argument as well, where someone tells me that that's just exactly what they do, and I'm like, I should do that. I should be more like you. <laughs> Anytime like a newer comic asks me for advice, I always predicate it with that. I'm like, I can give you some feedback, but just know that this is how I do it, mm-hmm. and that's maybe not how you're gonna do it, mm-hmm. and like. My feedback is usually like, oh, tighter, <laughs> like your voice is too monotone. But you know, if you're a dry comic mm. that has like a, like a verbose style of writing, that can be totally legitimate. Mm. And it's just like, I'm not a useful person to give advice for mm. in that regard. But like specifically bad advice. Oh, you know what? And this is from you, Kelly. <laughs> uh, I remember like, like before I had this like uh, perfume salesman facial hair, <laughs> uh, I was I was clean shaven because when this grows in, it does not look encouraging. Because I'm like the least hairy Arab, like like I don't Straight grow mind. facial hair well. So when you just see the beginning of this mustache and soul patch and like little chin strap, 
It looks like just the most awkward puberty <laughs> facial hair. So till my mid twenties, I always kept kept myself self clean shaven. So I always looked like seventeen, mm. uh, and everybody was always surprised that I was like twenty three mm. or whatever. Um, and I remember I started doing jokes about sex, and Kelly was just like. I think people want to hear you talk about sex. <laughs> <laughs> and then I grew facial hair and all of a sudden it was more palatable. I'm like, oh, here's an adult talking about sex, not a minor. <laughs> you know, A minor imagining what it's like. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dude, I bet pussy feels this way. <laughs> uh, if you had to form a super comedian out of like three comedians, who are you choosing and what are they bringing? That's to a great comedian? question. I already know Rory Scovel is one of them. I, Roy Scovel's probably like my favorite contemporary comic. Like I aspire just to be fucking silly <laughs> like him. And I, I really, we were talking, I was mentioning like a Norm Macdonald quote mm. to you outside where like he likes comics. Like you can be a hilarious comic, but if you're doing a lot of dirty and dark premises, you can feel your audience feeling a, like a little dirty afterwards, which there's, I still love those comics. Mm. Um, but to leave your audience just kind of smiling and feeling happy, that's how I feel anytime I watch Rory. Mm -hmm. Like, I just feel like I'm giggling with mm -hmm. a friend about some stupid shit, mm -hmm. which is like a discredit. His writing is also very actually like smart. He makes very qu good points about some stuff. But I, I would put like, I think his energy and like, I really like Michelle Wolf's like, uh, like she does like social commentary without it being like too holier than thou. So like those two plus, um, hmm. I love, you know, whatever you think about him, the way Louis CK will take an incredibly abstract, really intelligent concept mm. and explain it to you in like a 10 year old's vocabulary is so impressive to me mm. because he just uses completely accessible, comprehensible, like language mm. to like break down metaphysics. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. And anybody can get it. Yeah. So I think those, that would be like my, is it Voltron? Voltron, that's a good word. Voltron, uh, uh, what is it? The, the Star Trek? No, the, <laughs> there's like, it's like a transformer where they link up oh, and they yeah, form. Yeah, yeah. I think the, it's the, Voltron, yeah. right? Yeah, okay. Yeah. I don't know why I looked I to the camera. I trust camp. you more than <laughs> <laughs> they'll know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's um, a very good answer. Yeah, that would be mine. I'm watching Louis um, for the first time in the TV series. Through. What a fucking classic. It's, it's it's very good. Oh my god. I love how they he is like totally willing to like break reality. Mm. Like one of my favorite scenes in it is like he's in a really t cramped economy class seat in a plane and he's handed a literal thimble of water. <laughs> like it's literally this big and I love for the punchline he's just like I'm going to break reality. Like my point is is this is cramped and they they do not even hydrate you. <laughs> So instead of the real tiny paper cup you get, you just get the, he gets this thumb sized thimble. I love the, the that. First yeah, yeah, right. yeah, yeah, yeah. That's yeah. wonderful. Yeah. So what are your, what are the plans for the rest of the tour? It's, it's calling it a tour is generous. Uh, oh, you're Tory. <laughs> <laughs> well, really, I only have one proper headlining date, which is at the Bill Murray on the 22nd. Uh, tickets available on Event Friday on my Instagram. Anyway, um, I'm uh, flying out to Lisbon because mm. uh, when I booked this, I was like, oh yeah, everything in Europe's fucking right next to mm. each other. Um, and I have a friend out there who like got me on some shows. So I'm going to spend like three or four days there. I'm doing like two or three showcases and then I'm back here and I'm just going to be like, you know, because also dude, showcase spots here pay so much better mm. than the States. Like all the clubs in the States are owned by, ooh, I'm wondering if I should talk about this. I'll just say clubs have been paying comics the same rate that they were paying in the 80s. <laughs> and uh, you can't do shit with that money, really. Like all that money's covering is was your Uber to the venue or maybe dinner that night. Whereas here, like it seems like if you're getting booked on a lot of indie shows, you can maybe pay your rent with that. Mm. So it's 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 weird. It's like this seems like a great home base to have because like in a scenario where like, let's say you put out a special now you're out of material, you have to start from scratch. Mm -hmm. It seems like way more financially viable to, to be here. Cause like, bef like in the States you just accept like, all right, I'm going to have to do a couple tour spots a month to pay rent. Mm -hmm. 
and I'm just gonna go toil at the indie shows for like not even no money. I'm gonna lose money. Mm -hmm. Like you know, is that the new material nights? Is that what you say? There's the no new shows? material nights. Okay, so an indie that's show. That's a just... that's a that's here. New I new material nights are not a thing. Okay, so like in... like at some places they'll have like it'll be like the selling point of the show. Like it'll be a novelty that once a month they have a new material uh, night. Okay. There's so, a lot of stuff different here. So an indie show is just like an independent. Oh, like you like oh you go do a, a bar show. Ah, uh, okay. Um. But also, like, uh, like a lot of people run, like, they're called rental shows, where, like, you know, you rent the club on, like, a Wednesday mm -hmm. or whatever. So it's weird. It'll be an indie show at a major club mm -hmm. or whatever. But also clubs just have regular showcases, too, and they're booking you and stuff like that. But you're still, you're barely making shit. That's really cool that you say, like, here's a good home base, because I guess a lot of us here just look at America and we're like, wow, they can do seven gigs a day. I don't, I don't know Yeah. Yeah, it's weird. It feels like the inverse mm. where the way better home base seems to be here, but like the higher touring ceiling seems to be in the in the mm. US. Um yeah, if I was loaded, I think I would spend a couple months here a year <laughs> and like then go like get the work done in the in the states. Mm. Um but I I've, I've really liked it here. You fuckers book way too far in advance. <laughs> Wait, and it's 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 against the spirit of comedy. <laughs> Because comedy is spontaneous. <laughs> and like, I thought I was, be we were DMing about this. Oh, I should clarify, I was annoying you about this. Because like, Not I thought all, I was being super responsible and super proactive and professional by giving people two months notice. If you hit up any scene two months notice mm. uh, in the States, you are set, you're mm. solid. But here, like, the amount of weaseling I've had to do <laughs> to get on shows. Uh, they're like, ah, oh, it's a bit short. No like I'm booking these July dates back in f fucking early May. And they're like, ah, oh, it's a bit short notice. I'm like, what the fuck do you <laughs> mean short notice? Um, do you know what a guest set is? No. I can't believe it. You fucking, what have you done to our art form? <laughs> <laughs> guest sets, they're, we call them guesties. They're so common. It's like, oh, I have a fully booked lineup, but Mr. Famous Comedian Man's in town mm. visiting his sister. Let's give him six minutes. Mm. Like, we can't give him a full You're spot. only asking for, it's only for six minutes as well? No, like, 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 like I'm talking like, I'll run a show. This was yeah. a very common occurrence. Yeah. I'll run a show, it's fully booked. My friend, not even Mr. Famous out of towner. My friend shows up and he's like, ah, my show got canceled. I'm like, oh, you wanna do, you wanna do seven real quick? And like, it's such a casual, mm. like you get up, you do it like, like, like a lot, like, let's say like, oh, I have a taping coming up. It's sooner than I thought. Can I hop mm. on? Like, it's just so common. Mm. And here, the fact that nobody has understood the term guest set, it's weird. It's like, to me, it's as crazy as being like, do you know what a punchline is? <laughs> like, do you know what? Like, and they're like a punchline? <laughs> but I guess it's just because you're going for the, the the like the top clubs, like you have all the weird bars and the other stuff that are. Well, dude, more... guest sets are universal. Yeah, doesn't matter. That's like, cool. like literally, only the top top clubs are where like the guest sets are less common. But the people who get the the guest sets are like you know Aziz Ansari or mm. like yeah. Do you, know, do you know what the issue is? It's called well, getting bumped. Do you guys get bumped oh, here? Oh yeah, that's so we have that. But, okay, but... at least there's some purity. <laughs> The injustice of being bumped is universal. I, so. My theory, the reason we don't have the guest set is because like I run the night, for example, and if I advertise there's a guest set, everyone that wants a spot's gonna arrive and be like, <laughs> Well, we don't advertise set, it. No, yeah, it's yeah, implied yeah. now because people were showing up before and I said don't show up. If you're not I never guesses. dude, the the way people add and drop to shows so spontaneously in the States, I stopped advertising lineups. Mm. Like what I would advertise isn't what which comedians you'll see. I advertise the type of industry credits you'll see. Mm. Like, you, like I don't know who's on the lineup, mm. but you will see somebody who's been on Comedy Central mm. probably. You will somebody who, see somebody who's, so like my ad will be like, comedian seen on this, yeah. this, this, and more. That's because it's true. Mm. It's just that I don't know what it's gonna <laughs> be until like a week ahead, mm. dude, yeah. And then the only place that books with an American attitude is Top Secret, <laughs> which they have the, the reputation for being like very spontaneous. Mm. And I'm like, ah, I'm, I'm back home. You know? <laughs> well, I'm very happy you got in there because it's yeah. one of oh the best rooms in London. God, too. that 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 room is just about as good as any club I've done. Mm. Really, just about as good as any club I've done. So fun. Um, I will say, I was talking uh, earlier. 
uh, the intermission thing blows my mind here. <laughs> because if we had intermissions in the States, everybody would be like, that was fun, but do you want to get some Chinese food? Mm -hmm. Like, I'm kind of hungry now. And then whoever you'd have doing the back half would have like half the audience left here. But I watch like the intermissions here. Everybody steps out, pounds a drink, smokes a cigarette faster than I've ever seen anybody <laughs> smoke a cigarette. And the door guy's like, all right, get back in. And then they all go back in. I'm like, this is alien. This is crazy. I do want to clarify that is a very top secret. Oh, yeah. Because the the lesser where the gigs aren't as good. <laughs> People will be like, oh, we have an opportunity to skip. Yeah, let's go. <laughs> but but like I, I did the backyard yesterday, yeah, which was a lot of fun. It's and they had two or three. I think they had three intermissions. Mm. And I went up last. Every seat was still full. <laughs> and that is something that would just not happen. In this. That would absolutely not happen in the States. Because really honestly, close. like. I remember when you're new, like you, you, all you want to do is close out the show. Mm -hmm. Like you want the longer set at the end. You, you want this, the, the status, the opportunity to like stretch your legs more a bit mm -hmm. on stage. But like my friend Daoud, uh, eventually, like I would always book him to headline because he was like, you know, one of the varsity kids mm -hmm. when I like when I started. He was one of the big headliners in town, and I remember once. Um, I had this other headliner and and Dawood was like, hey man, my show got canceled. Uh, can I get on your show? And I had like a full spot left, like cause somebody else had canceled, right? And I was like, oh, I can get you on, but I'd, I'd have to put you first. And he was like, thank God. <laughs> because like as a headliner, what ends up happening is you, you on, on a showcase where like five comics have performed before you, like the audience is a bit fatigued. Some people maybe have, even if the show's great, mm. Some people have left home early. Um, so like, as soon as I became someone who headlined shows, I was like, can I go third, please? Like, <laughs> third is the best. Third. third is amazing. <laughs> third is is the best because like two people warmed them up. They still have all their energy. Mm -hmm. It's just it's just ripe for the taking. <laughs> um, but like when I saw that I was closing out shows here, I was like, I hope people stick around. <laughs> and yeah, they have. They have. Um, so you're gonna post more clips, do more dates. Uh, I'm, I've hit this point with clips where like the, the, this is maybe inside baseball, a uh, baseball, uh, it's like <laughs> cricket. <laughs> um, uh, the way social media algorithms have changed in like the last year or so, like it used to be like, if you have your audience and you post, your audience will see it. But now it's very competitive. So if you put out a piece of content that isn't really engaging your followers, nobody's going to see it, mm. right? So like now I really only put out clips if I'm trying to sell tickets to a show mm. because I started putting out, you know, once I like depleted my material mm. and ri started writing again, I felt like a joke was polished and finished. Mm. I'd put it out and it would do okay. But I realized that the clips that got me to blow up for the most part were jokes I worked on for a couple of years, mm. you know, like, like the, the the racial ambiguity one I keep referencing, that joke took me like three years to mm. finish writing. So I've kind of hit a point where I've accepted like, all right, this is the size audience I'm gonna have for a while. Mm. And once I'm like really just fucking proud of a joke, that's when I'm gonna start posting again. Because it's so, once you have a little, I'm sure you felt this, you have a little taste of success. You're like, I gotta start posting every day because that's the only way the algorithm's gonna favor me. And it's just like, ah, they're making us like a fucking sweatshop. <laughs> that's all it is, dude. It's like, it's a content sweatshop and they're working us to the bone to give us access to the audience we earned that's making them all their ad revenue. And I just decided like, I'm not playing the game anymore. Like, like now what I do is like, if I have like a crowd work clip, or something that's like, or like something where I just riff in the moment or or a joke that's very topical. Like I just put out a joke about AI because mm -hmm. like chat GPT was mm -hmm. going crazy, right? That's the only type of clip I'll post at the moment mm -hmm. because I'm like, those are spur of the moment. They're disposable, they're fun. Mm -hmm. um, and like, those are usually jerk, jerks, jokes that, um, you know, I'm not married to mm -hmm. or whatever. Uh, but yeah, right now I'm just working like, I feel like the old model was, you know, you put your 10 years in and you, you put out your hour. Mm. Now I feel like you should be putting out 15 minutes a year. Mm. You know what I mean? So like, I'm trying to do that. It's like, mm. I've got this 15 that I really like. And I'm thinking like, 
maybe by the end of the year of like maybe doing a co-headlining show with another friend who's at a similar point, mm. having it like multi-cam shot. And that's like the new quote unquote special is mm. you chop up that 15 and you put it out. Like you have like a two week stretch where you're posting every day and then you replenish. And mm. that's what I'm trying to go for now. It seems very smart. I well, hope, dude. I'm very excited for your show. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna come see it, and we'll get this out before the show. Okay, so hopefully yeah, I get cool. a few people from that. Has it been in how long was this? Uh, fifty-two. So oh shit. Yeah, <laughs> I'm dehydrated. <laughs> Take your water. No, the Adderall, man. <laughs> That's the main lesson. We all need to get on Adderall. Yeah. Oh, what a way. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I was but, so give the socials and the Bill Murray date. Uh, it's at Murad Shaki. M U R A H D S H A. WKI. I thought I lucked out getting my name. Nobody can fucking spell it. <laughs> and there's like... It took me two times. <laughs> dude, and it's like there's one guy who has at Murad, and it's not because his name is Murad. It's like his first initial yeah. and like part of his name turns into Murad. <laughs> he has like 50 followers. I've DM'd him like, please, can I have it? Please. Um, so please find at Murad spam him and tell him no don't do that please don't <laughs> harass that man um it's at Murad Shockey on uh instagram tiktok uh facebook is Murad Shockey comedian for some reason <laughs> um and uh on any one of those socials you can click my link tree there will be links to tickets um at the bill murray on the 22nd uh tickets are actually selling fast which is a fucking relief uh there's a few left i uh, would love to see some people out there cool well, yeah, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, everyone, for listening. If you enjoyed it, give it a five star on Spotty, Spotty, Spotify, or Spotty. Apple Podcasts. Spotty. I was like, I was like, oh, I was like, oh, <laughs> oh, yeah. I uh, just accepted that. It's like that's what people call Spotify here. Yeah, cool. And if you have any feedback, send it to me. And I will be posting clips soon on the Kid Podcast Instagram. But there, I'm a bit behind in those, to be honest. I don't like posting clips. It's I like capitalism, the, bro. Yeah, You're not behind they're, on anything. They're, they're Listen to your heart. Me, they're sleeping, but yeah. Thank you very much for coming. Dude. Of course, so it was good. a lot of thank fun. You.